Hello, and welcome to the Prague Analyst. Today we're going to be talking about the piano intro of the Genesis song, Firth of Fifth. I won't be discussing the whole song in this video, the goal of this analysis is just to break down that piano intro to understand how it's structured rhythmically and harmonically, and to look a little bit at Tony Banks' compositional style. I uploaded an introductory video to the channel that explains how these videos are going to work, so if you haven't seen that yet, I recommend you check it out, the link is in the description. Let's start by breaking down how the arrangement is structured between the two hands. The left hand switches between playing octaves in the lower range of the piano to provide bass notes, and playing chords more towards the center of the piano for harmonic context. Important notes and beats are accented with lower octaves, such as downbeats or dramatic chord changes. The right hand has non-stop, constant 16th notes, which can be a little difficult to digest, but there's a melody hidden in this mess of notes. These 16th notes are broken into groups of 4, 3, or 2. The pattern of 4 16th notes most often looks like this, an arpeggio, where the top note is played first, it jumps down, and moves up for the remainder of the arpeggio. The other pattern of 4 that sometimes occurs looks like or similar to this. Where after the previous pattern we just discussed, the line continues to move up stepwise, then does a little turn here. The set of 3 and 2 are also very similar to the first set of 4, only instead of having 3 notes below the melody, they have only 2 or 1 respectively. What we're seeing is this constant pattern of the first note of each set being a melody note, and the rest of the set being chord tones below the melody to fill the space. You could take away all of those filler chord tone notes to just get the melody notes, and if you know the song, you can still tell it's the first of fifth intro. So how are these groups of 2, 3, and 4 organized? There's some complicated time signatures in the beginning of the song, but there is a logic to it when we break it down into these smaller sets. We start with two sets of four with the arpeggios, then it quickens to four sets of three and two sets of two. These sets of three and two add up to a complete measure of four four, so even though the melodies and groups of three or two over it, we're still feeling the duple meter beneath it. Also notice how the pace quickens from four to three to two, and as the melodic rhythm quickens, we feel like we're rushing, giving us this rhythmic tension that'll be resolved once we get back to our sets of four in the next measure. We have two more sets of four in this 2-4 measure, then our first measure in 13-16. I had a lot of trouble with the rhythm of this measure when I was learning to play the song, but looking at the way it's broken up helps to understand the rhythm better. The rhythm in this measure is nearly identical to the measure of 4-4 two bars ago. It's just missing the fourth set of three. The stability we should get from the similarity of these two measures is taken from us through the removal of that final set of three, making us unable to complete the bar of 4-4, turning it into a measure of 13-16. This whole section repeats, making us feel that this is our main theme. The next 2-4 measure begins the same way as the previous 2-4 measures, but the second set of 4 is that turning pattern I mentioned earlier. This measure is mainly a transitional measure, and this pattern here moves the melody to the next section. Here we get 4 consecutive bars of 13-16, broken up in the same way as our previous 13-6 measure, with 3 sets of 3 and 2 sets of 2. After this 13-16 section, we move into 15-16. The breakdown of these measures is the same as the 13-16 measures, but now there is an extra set of 2 at the end, giving us 15-16 notes. So you can see 3 sets of 3 and 2 sets of 2, now it's turning into 3 sets of 3 and 3 sets of 2. This rhythmic change comes at the time when the harmony is modulating dramatically, and the unstable odd time signature and 3 consecutive sets of 2 each measure help to build this intensity. We get a moment of relief as we land in our new key, which will happen here. There is a measure of 2-4 with an arpeggio on our first beat and the turn in our second. Then, a measure of 13-16 divided in the way these measures always happen, 3 threes and 2 twos. This whole 2 measure pattern happens 3 times. And the fourth time, the measure of 13-16 gets an extra set of 3, as it modulates back to our original key, giving us a full measure of 4-4. When we land back in our original key, we get our first theme, those first four measures that were repeated at the beginning of the piece. The next measures of 2-4 and 4-4 rhythmically resemble the first two measures of our theme, and then we get a series of 2-4 measures that serve as modulation material into the key that the verses of the song are in. Although there are a lot of changes and complex rhythms in this part of the song, there are some patterns and some logic to its rhythmic structure. Now let's look at the harmony employed by Tony Banks in this part of the song. We start out the song in B flat major, and here we start with our B flat chord, our one chord. There's a brief moment where we get an E flat here for a sus4 chord, but that quickly resolves back to the third. Our next chord here is E flat, our four chord, followed by our one chord again in first inversion. Now when we get here, we could hypothetically call this next chord an E flat seven in third inversion, or the following chord as a C sus9, since if you played these chords out of context, that's probably what you would call them. However, that's not really how the chords are functioning here. They're acting as hybrid chords, which are chords in which the bass note is not a chord tone. The right hand simply switches between E flat and B flat again, our diatonic 4 and 1 chords, and the left hand is just moving down chromatically, so I'm going to call these chords E flat over D flat and B flat over C. This B flat we have over the C does resolve up to C major. 
which is the dominant of the next chord, F major, which is the 5 chord in B flat. So the C is a secondary dominant of F, which is the dominant of B flat. However, this F chord doesn't exactly resolve to B flat. The right hand does move to a B flat arpeggio, but the left hand moves to E flat. And the subdominant sound of that E flat is too hard to ignore for us to call this a resolution to the tonic in the right hand. This hybrid chord of B flat over E flat almost sounds like E flat major 9 without the third, but since it's missing such an important chord tone, it feels ambiguous. But like our ambiguous hybrid chords earlier, what's more important here is the bass motion, which leads us to D flat in the next measure. This is a flat 3 major chord in the key of B flat, obviously non diatonic, and here it's borrowed from B flat minor. Our next two chords are F with C in the bass and E flat, our 5 and 4 chords respectively, but we don't get the third on either of these chords. All of this feels unstable and is clearly just moving towards somewhere else. The last two chords of this bar are E flat minor and A flat 7, which have a 2 5 relationship. This particular kind of 2 5 between the 4 minor and the flat 7 is called the backdoor 2 5, because instead of resolving the way dominant chords usually do from 5 to 1, this chord sneaks in the back door and goes from flat 7 up a whole step to 1. This transitional measure starts with B flat, but we get this A flat here to make it a B flat 7, which is the dominant of our 4 chord E flat, which is where it will resolve in the right hand here. However, in the left hand we have F minor. So we have this tense polychord form measure, where the two hands are playing different chords. Then the right hand doesn't change at all going into this measure, staying on E flat, and the left hand gives us our resolution by moving to E flat. This pattern of E flat over F minor to E flat is repeated here with a little extra bass motion in the left hand to keep things exciting. And the B flat in the left hand here gives the E flat a second inversion feel, so that it still feels stable when the left hand resolves, but less so, as we're about to go into something new. Over the next four measures of 1516, we are modulating from B flat major to F sharp major. We move from E flat to A flat minor, which is a bit of an unexpected change since it's not closely related to our home key of B flat, but it's the start of a new development section, and its voice led smoothly from E flat. Later in this measure, we get a D flat 7, and here it's worth noting that A flat minor and D flat 7 do have a 2 5 relationship, and they are the 2 5 in the key we're moving towards, F sharp or G flat major. The modulation section could end right here and very naturally move to F sharp but Tony Banks keeps the development going for another three measures to build anticipation and intensity while moving through other chords. In this measure, he moves from D-flat 7 to D-flat or C-sharp minor 7. So the root note doesn't change, but the quality of the chord does. Notice how much more he's using the lower octaves in the left hand here. It's quite a contrast from the previous section and a lot more aggressive. The root moves up by half step to D major 7, and at this point it's sounding like each measure exists in its own harmonic world. Tony Banks is taking this motif and just moving it to whatever key he feels like. If we look at the first note of the right hand in each measure though, the melody is moving up sequentially by minor third. Then we get to G major 7. Again, this chord is not tonally related to the other material. The melody moves up by major third from the start of the previous measure to here, but this major 7 Lydian sound with the C sharp here allows this chord to just sit here without sounding like it's wrong, but also like it doesn't want to go anywhere in particular. In the second half of this measure, we have E, the flat 7 of the key we're moving to, which is F sharp, with a B in the bass, which walks down the F major scale until we land in F sharp major completely, right here. This place feels very resolved after the previous several measures of constantly shifting harmony, and this resolution is helped by the stability of these sets of four, and the way the melody is a variation of the theme we've heard before, only the notes are changed to fit F sharp major instead of B flat major. Before it was, now it's. This whole section is all in F sharp major and uses chords diatonic to that key with an F sharp pedal tone in the bass. These chords moving back and forth are G sharp minor and C sharp 7 the 2 5 regression in the key of F sharp. This measure modulates us back to B flat. Here we just get a B flat chord, which immediately catches our ear as an out of key chord after 7 measures of exclusively F sharp. Next is a D sharp diminished chord, further dissociating us from F sharp major. The notes of a D sharp diminished chord are also chord tones of F7, which is the dominant chord of B flat major, with the exception of F sharp, which is a flat 9. The following chord though is an F chord. And with these four chords, switching back and forth between each other, the effect is an F dominant 7 sound, leading us back to B flat major. In these four measures, we restate our theme from the beginning of the piece, and now we need to modulate to B major, which is the key of the verses of the song. This material is all the same as our original theme until we get to this point, where we get a curveball of an E major chord. The next two chords don't give us enough harmonic information to tell exactly what chords they are, but since this chord has chord tones of E flat major, and this chord has chord tones of D major, with the E major preceding it, I hear these three chords as chromatically moving major chords in second inversion. Here we get B flat 7, so B flat no longer feels quite stable enough to be home. Then there is an abrupt modulation to C sharp minor 7, which is supported by the melody moving chromatically up to land on B here, then the rest of the measure moving through C sharp Dorian. C sharp minor is the 2 minor of B, then we get F sharp, the 5 of B, 
So we have 2 to 5 to 1 in B major. Although the harmony in the song is pretty complicated and challenging to pull apart, there are some important takeaways that we can learn about Tony Banks' compositional style. First is his abundant use of arpeggios, which are strongly present as a motif in this piece, but are also present in his other solos, such as in Supper's Ready or In the Cage. Quarterly, he also uses a good amount of 2 fives and occasionally diminished chords, especially to help with modulations. Finally, he uses hybrid chords or polychords in which the motion of the melody or bass line is actually more important than the vertical harmony itself, in moving from measure to measure or section to section. That's my complete breakdown of the piano intro of Firth V by Genesis. For those of you who know the song well, this piano intro is reprised later in the song as a keyboard solo with the whole band. It's an iconic piece of Genesis's, and I highly recommend you listen all the way through if you haven't already. Thank you for watching. If you learned something new or enjoyed the video, please like it and share it with anyone else who might be interested. Let me know in the comments if there's anything else about this song you enjoy or find interesting that I might not have mentioned. If you want to see more of these videos, please subscribe as well. I have my first few videos lined up already, but if you have any suggestions of prog rock songs you want to see an analysis video of, leave those in the comments as well. The next video will be about the Porcupine Tree song, The Start of Something Beautiful. Thanks again!